Welcome to The Net Effect, career conversations and connections. Each episode is devoted to bringing interesting guests who offer insights and perspectives on casting one's net on the right side, as Jesus challenged his apostles to do on the Sea of Galilee. Well, welcome everyone. This is the Net Effect Career Conversations and Connections, episode 36. We have as our special guest, one of the most recognized muralists in the country, Alex Cook, artist and Christian musician. I'm your host, Robin Jones, director of the ABF Career Alliance. Alex is here to tell us how he has been casting his net on the right side as Jesus challenged his followers to practice. I'm so excited for y'all to get to know Alex and to learn about his incredible and inspiring work. So let's get to it. Welcome, Alex. Thanks so much. Great to be here. So glad to have you coming from that bright and sunny East Coast in Massachusetts. That's right. Um, I'm going to turn on our screen share. So I, I thought we'd start off with a couple of, of your murals to kind of let people see what you've done. It's since 1997, you've created over 200 murals in 20 states That's and right. four countries. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And um, in, 2000, in 2004, he founded Art Builds Community, um, a mural painting for teenagers for his hometown in Boston. So Alex has been really active in, in, loads, in loads of communities. But I thought we'd try to uh, you know, understand where Alex has been and kind of how he got to where he is. Um, so why did you pick art in college? Oh, well, uh, art always was a real natural fit for me. Um, when I was a kid, I loved to make things. Um, and then as I grew up and was a teenager, I just was seeing beauty all over the place. I was just seeing things that were moving me. And the, the natural response when I saw something beautiful was to try to reflect it back, you know, try to participate in it by, by making something beautiful in, in response to the beauty I was seeing in the world. Well, tell us about, tell us about your first mural, this picture, and describe it for a little bit and kind of how it came to be. Right. Uh, so this is my first mural I ever painted in 1997. Um, the image for folks uh, who are on the phone um, who can't see it on the screen is it's a, it's a tree of life. Um, it's about 10 feet across and about 16 feet tall. Um, and it has these green leaves in kind of like a, a mandala sort of, sort of uh, look. Uh, and then there's an angel over the top of it. And at the bottom is a town, a city, that's much smaller than the tree itself. Uh, and that to me was really central to the meaning of this image. Uh, the tree of life was basically a symbol of everything spiritual, you know, sort of the sense that I that I had and have that there is this spiritual reality. Uh, and it was so significant to me that I could make this tree that was so much bigger than the city where we live, you know, that symbolically this spiritual existence towers over the the daily events of our of our lives. I'm curious to know um, how, you know, did did this materialize? I mean, it was just kind of like an epiphany. Was it all of a sudden you saw this brick wall and and, <laughs> and there was this tree on it as, a, as an image? No, it, it, it really was was a lot of steps and lots of epiphanies along the way. Um, the, the truth is, at that point, I was a senior in college. I was about to be, you know, heading out into the world and needing to, to make my way. Um, and the, the fact is, I was really scared about 
how I was going to make my life as an artist. You know, I had, I had this fountain of images inside of myself. I was just constantly having all these ideas and inspirations. Um, and the idea of not being able to share them successfully was absolutely terrifying to me. Not to mention, you know, how are you going to pay the rent and all, all the, the basic regular concerns. Um, so, so that was really weighing heavy on me um, in my last semester of college. And um, I had to uh, create this body of work to, to graduate. And uh, I was just thinking long and hard about what that was going to be. And in one of these epiphanies, one of these inspirations, um, it just came to me that instead of, uh, after I graduated from college, instead of trying to get a gallery or somebody to show my work and who's gonna even go into a gallery anyway, if I could get somebody to let me paint on their wall, I would have a guaranteed audience. Um, and so, you know, that was the, the inspiration for the, first, for the first mural was just sort of skip the middleman, go straight to the people and try to share my work. Um, kind of gain the confidence to say, I'm good enough. I'm good enough to do this. How, well, where did that come from? That was never a problem. Honestly, I just, I just felt it. I loved making pictures. I knew I was good at it. I did it and did it and did it and did it. I knew I was good because I practiced a lot. You know, um, uh, it was what I did for fun as well as what I did for school. So, you know, I finished my homework and then I would keep painting um, because it was what I loved to do. Um, so I had confidence because I was just very, very active in it you know, working hard. And so did, did, did your career start to take off? Did you, did it, did it have the desired effect that you thought it would? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a very long story, a long path. Um, you know, that, that first mural kind of typifies something that has taken place again and again and again, which is you have a new idea, you have an inspiration, you set about doing it, and then along the way, there's some really strong fear that has to be overcome. Oh yeah, man, I've had that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you so, attack that? Well, so so just to tell the story of that first mural, um, it really was very very intense. So I had the inspiration to do it. I walked around the town where I was, Northampton, Massachusetts. I was looking for for buildings that I could paint on. And I saw this wall and I found out who owned it. And I called the guy up and we had a conversation, showed him my sketch and he said, yes. So that, that's, that's the very short version of the story. So I'm out there with my paints. I have my sketch and yeah, there it is. Uh, and I was about to put the brush on the wall and start the mural. And as I did, as I went to put the first stroke on the wall, I was gripped with a fear so strong I couldn't move. Uh, um, it's on a main thoroughfare in Northampton, Massachusetts. There's hundreds of cars going past every hour. And this was the first time I'd ever worked in public. And I just thought, what if I mess up? <laughs> right. I mean, this is like taking the most personal thing, thing that I did in my studio privately all the time, but I never did it publicly and just putting it right out there in front of hundreds of strangers every hour, you know, thousands of people every day. Um, and I couldn't move. Yeah, and I can't imagine you'd have a big enough eraser, right? I mean, what are you going to do? There's no erasing. Right? <laughs> There's no erasing. So, you know, I, I thought, what if I make a mistake? I always make mistakes when I'm painting. You know, what if, I, what, if, what if I get too nervous and I can't retract what I've done and I ruin this guy's wall and, you know, I, I embarrass myself beyond ever coming back from it. Um, and I was so overcome with this fear that I literally couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, it was very painful. So I, you know, not knowing what else to do, I put my brushes down and I just walked back from the wall, stood there right in the parking lot of this, of this uh, shop right there. And I just prayed. And my prayer was very simple. It was, what do I do? You know, uh, it was God. You, I, I really felt that God had brought me to this place. I had been praying. Um, and I really thought that God had opened the, the way 
for this project. So I felt very stuck. Um, so I said, what do I need? What, what do I need to do? Um, and very quickly, a thought kind of crystallized in my mind. You know, my eyes are closed. I'm standing in this parking lot. Um, and this thought came and it just said, this isn't about you. This isn't about what people think about you. This is about your ability to give a gift. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I can give a gift. I, like I said, I, I felt confident. I knew the picture was good and I knew that I was a good artist, but I had been, the fear was about what are they gonna think about me? What if, what if I make a mistake? What if what I do reflects badly on me? And in that moment, you know, this really, it was such a surprising thought because I thought it was about me. It was very surprising to have this new idea say, you know, very, and actually very, very uh, confidently, it's not about you. Um, and then, and then I started thinking about all the people in the neighborhood and I thought, oh yeah, I, I, I want to be able to make a picture that's going to comfort somebody when they're, you know, they just got broken up with or, or, or they're coming home from work and they're exhausted or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever is, is the, the problem. I, it was really empowering to think there are these people and they're going to see my picture. Um, and I thought about how much pictures had healed me, how much they had comforted me and inspired me. I thought my power here is to give a gift, to give a gift of beauty and inspiration. And with that, within just a few minutes, the fear that had been like a, like a vice just like disappeared, just dissipated mm -hmm. and it was gone. And I proceeded and um, went ahead and, and painted this mural uh, and it was exactly the opposite of what the fear had been suggesting. Ah. People were clapping out of their cars. People were 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 uh, hollering to me, you know, great job, looks beautiful. Um, you know, all of these connections, real human beings, real people um, stopping on the street, pulling their cars over to ask me what it was about, you know, all these beautiful, friendly conversations. Um, so it ended up being uh, the, the best instead of instead of the worst. And I fell in love with mural painting from that from that moment on. Well, I know you're a guy full of ideas. And obviously, this idea came forward. And um, tell us about <laughs> this 1993 Mazda 323. Yeah, well, so so my my life as an artist has always been primarily about creating beautiful things. You know, taking my best ideas, my best inspirations from God and putting them into the world. It's, it's, it's never, it, that has always been first. And second is, you know, all the practical concerns. Um, so when I have an idea that is moving to me, I pay attention to it. Um, and also, you know, if we truly have this, this faith that these ideas are coming from God, that's different than if they're coming from me. You know, I really have to respect the ideas that come as inspiration. Um, so this is now, you know, maybe seven years later after that first mural. Um, and I'm just going through my life and just passing, just going through my life pops into my mind a picture of my car painted like a little brown bird. It just popped into my mind and I thought, oh, that'd be cool. And went on with my life. Um, and the idea just kept, kept popping into my mind. Um, and for about a year, I just thought, well, you know, that's, that's a cute idea. Um, but never, never did it. But after about a year, I thought this idea keeps coming to me and it keeps having this good kind of lovely feeling coming with it. And I thought maybe, maybe I should do that. Maybe I should paint my car to look like a bird. And then it got real because 
that's an unusual thing to do. Yeah, just in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, but you know, the uh, I, I really pride myself on having respect for the inspirations that come, and think of myself as a servant to them. Um, you know, in my, at my best moments, I am a servant to God through the inspiration inspirations that come um anyway so so after this a year i thought okay i'm gonna go ahead and do this and um very similarly to the first mural story i went out there in the driveway my car my white car is sitting there um and the moment literally the moment i went to do it the fear the enormous gripping fear, paralyzing fear. And this time it was, you know, when you, your car is kind of an expression of you or people feel that way. Uh, people are gonna see me in this everywhere I go. Um, and it's just very, very unusual to stand out like that. Um, the fear was people are gonna pity you. People are gonna think you're actually a crazy person. <laughs> Um, and they're going to lose all respect for you. It was a very cruel, cruel fear. And again, I couldn't, I couldn't move forward. And the very same thing happened. Uh, I prayed, I put down my brushes and I prayed. And the cool thing about prayer, as we know, is it's different every time when you're really doing it. Um, and this time a question, a question came to my mind. It said, Alex, do you believe in beauty? And I did. And I thought, yeah, I do. I really do. You know, I, I, this is what I'm living for. And when I answered that question, I thought again of those fears of people, uh, you know, losing respect for me. And in an instant, it was turned on its head. I thought if they lose respect for me, for doing something beautiful, that's on them. Because, because I will never uh, stand down from expressing beauty. You know, beauty is right. Doing what God says is right. And in a moment, I didn't care what people were gonna think about me. It was very amazing to just, it just turned, it just switched. Uh, and I didn't care what people thought because I knew that doing right is right. Um, so I went ahead and painted the book, painted the car and it, it came out, you know, you can see the pictures of it. And again, just like that first mural, people were like cheering as I walked down the street. I got a note under my windshield wiper that said, your car is the most beautiful car in the neighborhood. Um, you know, my little, my little junky Mazda next to, you know, there are plenty of fancy cars in my neighborhood. Um, I just thought, wow, you know, people are appreciating, appreciating this thing. And, and again, it was, it was, I knew that it had ended up being a gift to the people in the neighborhood that, that people enjoyed it. People got a sense of delight and, um, and joy from, from this thing that I had done. And of course it didn't end up reflecting badly on me. Uh, it reflected beautifully on me, but in each case, it was a matter of sort of getting me out of the way and being less concerned about myself and more concerned about being obedient to inspiration and thinking about the, the folks that I could bless by. We well, you know so many of um, the, you know, folks that are in their twenties and thirties today have such a difficult time embracing Christianity or even affiliated in any way towards Christianity. And yet you, you say you're a Christian musician and, and there, there, there obviously came a point when you decided to pursue music and, and, you know, go in a direction still artistic, still creative, obviously, but you know, how, how did that come about and, and why? And, and why Christian musician? Yeah, well, I have to be really clear here that um, 
you know, you said I decided to, to do these things and it's true, I did. Um, but in almost every significant thing I've ever done in my life, I don't feel that I have decided anything. I feel that I have been led, truly led, like, like uh, if, I, if I had decided to do it myself, it would have failed. I would have been way too embarrassed. I would have not known what to do, you know, um, but, you know, going back long before this and through it all, because, I mean, it's hard to be an artist, you know, it's, it's hard. And the, the things that are thrown in your way are so difficult to navigate. I can't imagine being an artist without, without prayer, honestly. Um, because I depend so much on the guidance that I receive in prayer, not only to know how to do the things, but even to know what to do, what to make the paintings of, you know, where every facet of it is that it's just so easy to fail as, as, as an artist, um, uh, not only outwardly, but inwardly with confidence and, and all these things that, uh, you know, I just, every step of the way have, have fought it out depending upon guidance from God. So, you know, after years of doing this, it becomes normal. Um, and you get kind of less afraid of the uncertainty and more certain that uh, the idea is going to evolve. Um, and so the idea was evolving. I had been painting murals for about uh, maybe 10 or 10 years or so, 10 or 11 years and had been, you know, pursuing it and enjoying what I was doing and learning and, and, you know, making my living at it better and better. And I just had this feeling in myself, right around 2007, I, I had this feeling that something was going to change. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. Um, I happened to be wrestling with a bunch of sort of other things in my life that was causing me to pray a lot. I was praying a lot that year. And at the end of about a, a year, of praying about what to do with my career and all kinds of other things, I received this very specific instruction just in my thought. It was very specific, maybe the most specific instruction that I ever received. It said, every weekday morning from eight till 12, you are to do nothing but be creative. That's kind and of like one of those one of those biblical, you know, <laughs> messages, like it's in the, the Bible lesson this week, you know, it's like, here's this message. Yeah. I mean, and, and it just came in thought. It came with a great certainty, but it just came in thought. There was no evidence of it anywhere to see with my eyes. And, and I knew what it meant. It meant you're not allowed to answer emails. You're not allowed to look for work. You're not allowed to, it, what it meant was you're only allowed to basically play. Hmm. And it felt kind of irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> were you, were, I mean, where are you going to get the inspiration for four hours a day yeah. of playing? What does that, yeah. how, where does that come from? Yeah, I, 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 had, I had no idea. My, my best guess was that I was going to be making a new series of paintings. That was my best guess. And, and I literally, I was taking it very literally, you know, if this is God telling me what to do, I'm going to do it. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to make. But I was tr more and more just trusting, you know, if I pray and I get an answer, it's my job to do what that answer says. <laughs> so uh, that this happened to be the the... January 2nd, probably, um, 2008, the very beginning of the year, it was like my new life, you know, going to spend the first four hours of every day being creative. And, you know, it's a, it's a long, it's a long actual story, but to, to make it shorter on that first day, you know, 8 a.m. came, I was ready to be creative. And I thought I was still didn't know what I was going to do. Um, <laughs> so I prayed in that moment. And the inspiration said, this is not about you creating products. This is not about you creating works. This is about 
uh, this is about God's love. And, and I felt that meant, Alex, you have to be kind to yourself in this moment. Mm. It was basically like, don't take a personal responsibility for what God is doing. So I thought, well, you know, what feels good to me right now is to go for a walk. <laughs> That's inspirational. So I went for a walk. And just went for a walk. You know, that was the next the next step. And while I was on the walk, I started humming a little tune. And by the time I got back from the walk an hour and a half later, that tune was a bass line. Wow. And I went in and I recorded the bass line. I had been rec I've been recording music at my house for forever. Um, I recorded the bass line. Hmm. I thought, oh, that's cool. And I put a little guitar part to it. Um, and then, I as I mentioned, I had been praying, praying for about a year. I was really in the books. I was really in the Bible. And I just started putting words to the bass line and the guitar part that I had written. And out came this song, the first song I ever wrote that was about God. Hmm. That happened in the first week of this new discipline. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, and that just kind of opened the faucet. Huh. I started writing songs about God. I had wanted to write songs about God kind of forever, but, but felt I didn't have the authority. I felt I didn't have the, I don't know, I didn't have the authority to, to do it. But after this year of being so heavy in the books, uh, it just did. And the faucet opened. And that spring, beginning of January until about May, I did this discipline. And I wrote 25 songs, recorded them all. And that became my first two albums. That began a five-year period where I was touring around the country, playing concerts, making my living, selling my CDs and performing concerts at churches and elsewhere all over the country it really was an incredible dream come true i had wanted to be a professional musician you know forever and i had tried and tried and tried and failed and failed and failed um and it wasn't until this time i had I mean i had given up on that dream 10 years earlier um but then here here it was basically given to me um i mean there was plenty of work to do but but it achieved this this outcome that I could never, ever have achieved had I myself decided to do it, you know, set it for a goal and then tried to do it. No, that's not how it worked. Um, it was really this step-by-step -step listening. I didn't know how to record a CD. I didn't know how to put together a tour. I didn't know how to negotiate prices for a concert. You know, every piece of it was, was brand new and worked out through prayer, and I have to say, lots of trust and bravery. You know, there's so many opportunities to mess up and embarrass yourself and, you know, all kinds of things. But uh, there's, a, there's a verse that I love. Um, I forget which one of Paul's letters it's from, uh, where he says, we are fools for Christ. And I honestly feel that way. Um, because so often the ideas that come are tell me to do things that I don't know how to do. But boy, you know, I grow and grow and grow. My skills increase, my confidence increases, my faith in God increases. Um, this process of getting an idea, really trusting that it's a good inspiration, a holy inspiration, and then saying, okay, well, we're going to figure out how to make it happen and, and moving ahead. And that happened with, with this um, with this music career, which then went on, you know, uh, I started keeping the emails that I received from people who had the CD and, and, and were praying with a particular song, you know, I was receiving all these emails and messages and stuff from people that were, that were being comforted and healed by these songs. And I thought that is amazing. Beginning from this thing of, I'm going to be creative for four hours a day where there was no directive to make music, start a tour, you know, it just happened via inspiration. And then here's the evidence that people are being blessed by it. It was like very, very- I love powerful. what you just said. You know, one of the questions I have, 
And I, I love that you shared this with me about, you know, your West Coast tour. And one of your dates was in Seattle. And it was a small concert. And you had asked the organizer, how many people should you expect in the room? And the organizer told you 30 to 40 people. Yep. And so you're, you're warming up and going through your routine. And then you peeked out behind the curtain and noticed there were six people in the room. The, the, the greatest fear, right, of an artist. You want to perform and you've made this trip and there's no one to, to sing to. Yeah. How did you how did you manage that? How did you address that? What what did how did you go about finding the courage to go forward in that situation? Well, I mean, like like I said, so many times along the path of this of this adventure, um, there is fear and embarrassment and all kinds of things that try to keep the work from happening. And like you said, you know, I had been I had been told there should be 30 or 40 people at this event. And I looked out and there were six and it was two minutes till the time I was to start when I saw that. And I was mortified. I mean, I was really like struck with shame, like a really bad feeling of like, who who do I think I am? Right. Um, but but every step of the way I was in I was in prayer. Um, so. I took my embarrassed self, you know, back behind the curtain and, and prayed. Um, and again, a question came to my thought. And I don't know about you, but I noticed that when, when I'm feeling something really pressing on me, whether it be embarrassment or fear or whatever, I can get into this place. The need to defy it is so strong. And that prayer has to defy that feeling. You know, turning away from the embarrassment to something else, to something good. And, and sometimes I hear these real clear things. And the question that came to me uh, was, how many people do you usually have asking you for, for inspiration? You know, and I thought back to myself sitting in my room writing these songs. Oh, there was nobody there but me. There was zero. All right. I thought, wow, six human hearts have come out of the wilderness of the world to come hear me sing. Hmm. And again, it just turned it right around. And I thought, wow, six people. I can, I can, who knows what those six people have going on, but like, I've got some spiritual meat for them and I'm going to make this, this meal and we're going to enjoy it together. And I went out there and we had a great show. And after the show, this woman comes up to me uh, and told me that she had been recently divorced uh, mm -hmm. and that, you know, just told me that the songs had really touched her and that really touched me. You know, I said, this, this is enough. Uh, and, you know, not every concert was like that. There, there were, you know, course, the majority yeah. of concerts, there's, there's all kinds of people there. But, but from that moment on, I just never could be embarrassed about who I played to. I never could be could be afraid about that anymore. I had a similar thing, a similar thing one time we were performing at a, um, I was with a band, we were performing at a, at a nursing home, at a Christian science nursing facility. And there was a thing in me that said, this isn't cool. You should be rocking out to a bunch of, to a different audience. And I thought that, you know, and, and, and through my prayers that that, that terrible voice got destroyed no these are these are you know every audience matters it, it was it was step by step this thing of knocking out of the way wrong notions about about what's cool and what isn't about people that matter more than other people no no this this is this is about god's message of blessing for his children so, you know, every step of the way, it's changing me. It's, I have to get better in order to do the, the mission that has been laid out in front of me. Well, fast forward, and now you're, you're back into a new campaign <laughs> with new inspiration. You're love, you're needed, you're important. Uh, this is actually, describe this 
mural. So you're, you're now you're, you're into murals and painting murals again after six albums. Is that right? And yep. touring and recording. Yep. How did this come about? Well, God's timing is, is pretty, pretty immaculate. Uh, every, every year from 2009 to 2014, I, I made an album. Uh, every, every year was an exploration, a new thing. And, and every, every year, uh, as anyone who's, who's trying to do work that's, that's valuable and staying, staying alive, I would check in with myself and say, you know, am I doing the right thing? And every year I said, yeah, you know, we've got uh, the next album is coming. When I came home from my tour at the end of 2013, I had been on the road for, for five months, I checked in and I said, what's the next album going to be? And the voice said, there's no out, al- there's no next album. Hmm. And I was, just out of the blue. Well, it, it wasn't, it wasn't in words like that. It was, it was just a feeling that I knew that if I made another album, which I could, mm-hmm. that I would be, that I would be going over material that I had already gone over. Hmm. I felt that I had made that statement. The statement that was being made through music, I felt that I had said what I had to say. And I just, you know, I know my artistic voice. I've been doing it long enough. I just respect it. I it said that 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 message has been said. So you can make another album, but it's gonna be, you're gonna be repeating yourself. And I never want to repeat myself. I hate that. I always like to do something, something new. I'd like to be exploring. So I was obedient and I and I said, okay, no album, no album coming, but so what is it gonna be? And the, the month prior to that, in the last month of this tour I had been on, I had been doing some concerts in New Orleans. And uh, while I was there, I had about a week between two events. And I, you know, I hate free time. I love, I love, to, I love to work. So I, I went to one of the concert organizers, um, and I, I knew that she was the, the principal of a, of a nearby school. And I said, you know what? I have a free week. I'd love to just paint a mural at your school. And she said, great. So, so we went and painted a mural at her school. And she mentioned to me that one of the things they were working on at the school was helping the children feel more safe. I guess they had had a problem with, it, with kids feeling unsafe and it was getting in the way of their learning. So while I was figuring out how to do that, how do you, how do you make an artwork that's gonna help a child feel safe? I was praying. And another question came to me, it said, why are you trying to beat around the bush? Say what you mean. And I knew what we meant was that these kids are loved. These kids are valued. The teachers, the principals, the people there love these kids. And I said, I thought, what if we just write it on the wall? What if we don't make a picture? What if we just write it right on the wall? And I went to the principal and said, what if we just say, you are loved on the wall. And she was, she was into it. And the cool thing was it felt to me like I was crossing some kind of a boundary. Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's an intimate thing to say. You are loved to a bunch of strangers. And I thought, you know, am I allowed to do this in a public place? Can you, <laughs> can you, can you say this in a public place? But we did. And the, the mural that you're looking at now is from several years later the mural that's on the screen it's it's orange and red and blue and purple it says you are loved and there's a really really intricate design all all through it if in anybody who's listening you can see a lot more of these images at uh you are loved murals.com if you if you ever want to you can go check out these images at another time um uh so anyway this this mural that we're looking at now happens to be at a at an elementary school in in southern california but the project, so I took that first idea from the from the mural at in New Orleans, and those, you know, that was I wrote that out little. I, that was the first one, you know, I wrote it out real little. But I came home from that tour, and I didn't have anything to do because there was not a next album coming. And I thought back to that, and that idea was looming large in my mind, you know, painting this this message, this intimate message in public. And I said, okay, that's what we're doing. I jumped right in, and that's what I've been doing for the last seven years. Pretty remarkable. 
Yeah, now there are a little over over 80 of these UR Love murals in, in I think 13 states around the country with all kinds of organizations, schools, churches, prisons, government organizations, homeless shelters, businesses. Um, it really has been, it's very amazing to go to a public place and say something so so pure and intimate and and um, and also the, these murals have a community aspect. They very often have uh, we we invite volunteers to come and help paint, so it ends up being you know a place where people can really connect and feel a warm, safe, positive healing healing connection. Well, I'm um, I'm curious to, to know <clears throat> what kind of. Do, do have you have you have you experienced? Have you heard? Have you have you seen people looking at it? Have you seen people? Do people tell you, you know, gosh, that that's just so inspiring? I mean, I know that one of the thoughts that you had was, wouldn't it be wonderful if someone who is having a challenge, maybe they're homeless or maybe you know they're they're a victim of something, looks up to see this. I know mm -hmm. that that's something that is really important to you to be able to speak to some of those people that may not have anybody to talk to or may be uncertain or may be fearful or may be in a position where they're just not able to reach out to someone. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, d during some previous years from 2007 to 2014, uh, I was working as a volunteer chaplain at a jail here in Boston. So uh, I, just let me just interrupt. I did have a question about how how do you turn volunteering into something that can help you with your career? How how does you know can volunteering enable you help you build skills that can bless and benefit one's career uh, professional career? I think the question you're asking is specific to this mural we're looking at right now. Is that right? Yeah. Well, well um, definitely. Uh, volunteering has played a big part in, in moving my career along. The ideas that I have had have, have not always been easy to put into a product, you know, to create mm -hmm. something that people readily want to buy. They've just been inspirations. Mm -hmm. So very often, in order to get someone to buy something, you have to show them what it is. For if you want to put that mural back up, this this mural here, this this forest, this love forest. This is this is something that I that I did. I, I found this wall uh, here in Boston, and uh, and it was such a beautiful wall and such a such a wonderful place that that so many people could see that I really wanted to paint on it. And I had this idea to paint a forest on that. Just it's what I wanted to do. It wasn't I wasn't trying to you know, make a lot of money. I just desperately wanted to, to paint this mural. So I went to the, this happens to be at, at the Boston Housing Authority offices in here in Boston. Um, and I went in, I just walked in off the street and I said, look, I, I want to paint a mural on, on your wall. And they, they said, you know, we're not interested at this time. And I was sad, but, you know, I was used to, you know, there's all like, rejection <laughs> every which way as an artist. So that was normal. Um, I happened to be biking by the next year. Uh, and I saw that wall and I thought, oh man, I really want to paint on that wall. And I walked in and I had my portfolio with me and I showed them some pictures and I said, you know, I'd really love to paint a mural on their wall. They said, we're not interested at this time. And so I, you know, left again and I went back the next year, the next summer, I went back because it's such a good wall. And, and I, I realized at this point, I just want to make this mural. I want to use my skills. I want to do I just want to crush this thing. I want to make the best possible thing that I can because I don't always get to do that. You know, there's there's commercial concerns, uh, different people who are who are uh, you know asking for for my services. It's got it's it's their subject matter, and I was just dying to to do the art that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I went in there resolved to tell them that they didn't have to pay me anything. And I, and I said just that, you know, I want to paint your, I want to paint your wall. You don't have to pay me, but if you don't pay me, I get to do exactly what I want. And they said, and I showed them the picture of what I wanted to do. And they said, okay, great. So I spent uh, one, this, I spent the month uh, of July that summer, just indulging my every wish to make the best possible thing that I could do at that moment in my life. 
And the outcome was kind of pride, kind of feeling of of joy that, that I never had known to that point. You know, doing doing seeing the thing that started in here and having it be in all its glory for anybody to see out there in the world. It's an amazing thing to truly, truly do your best. Leave it all on the field and just see where you're at. And the wonderful thing, of course, when you show that you can do something really good, people want it. And this certainly did, you know, get me this picture, being able to show this picture got me all kinds of jobs in the, in the coming years after that, um, which was not part of my plan. <laughs> but, you know, I think a pure heart gets gets led properly and my pure desire to to make beauty has just been been led to to do these things this is this is another one uh similar thing this is now in 2015 um i had a similar feeling of of all of this this creative desire kind of coming to a fever pitch in me um where i had all these ideas that that weren't finding ready places to to be made and i thought you know if I don't do this, if I don't do these ideas now, when am I going to do it? Am I going right, to keep putting right. off these ideas because of because of other paying jobs or uh, or whatever? You know, I'll be sad if I get to the end and I haven't done my best inspirations. So, in 2015, I r- did a a crowdfunding campaign where I, I raised uh, raised fifteen thousand dollars through through this network that I had been building up over these years and years. Um, of people who who just donated so that I could make these three murals that were, were just these people really, local or were they kind of all over. Well, you know, I, I had been traveling for music. I was traveling more and more. I at that point, you know, knew people all over the country and and elsewhere who believe in my work, who who knew my music, who knew my murals. You know, a melange of of people who knew me from all different kinds of places, but who supported my work. And you know, much to my joy. Uh, it's very wonderful to find that people support your work. And even when they're not necessarily getting part of the product, it was, you know, it's very wonderful to do, to do a crowdfunding campaign and find that, you know, however many hundred people, I don't even remember how many, but it was, you know, a few hundred people who, who gave money to that. And then I'm thinking about these people and their love as I'm creating the murals. It really enriches everything. It makes it a, a more social thing. As, as in any business, the more you connect people to the work, uh, when people love the work, when they see that you're being honest about it, when you're really coming from a place of, of integrity and including them, p- connections is what is what makes is what makes business work and what makes art work. You know, art both art and business, I really think, are about having p- satisfying relationships, um, whether it be interpersonal relationships or somebody sees the work of art and is fed by it. You know, it's all about having people find the the thing that that connects them that makes them feel feel valuable well in looking at your landscape now and and thinking about if people have a similar interest or they they have some of these similar fears or thoughts or i i love what you put together here um tell us a little about these three points uh-huh well, uh, in, in any career, but certainly in an art career, um, there's a lot to balance. And I think one of, the, one of the main things for an artist anyway is to balance the thing that you want to do with the practical needs of paying the rent, getting jobs, et cetera. So my first thing was be willing to do the work that isn't your heart's desire without giving up on the goal to follow your passion. I think, you know, I think of all the times when when I took jobs that weren't the perfect job, but they were pretty good, so th- that I could then pour my energy into learning how to make the, the relationships, learning how to make art that would satisfy the customer, rather than sitting in my studio making my perfect work but having nobody see it. Right. Um, so that you know, there there really is a skill uh, to be learned about meshing the inspiration with the very practical nuts and bolts needs. What's the next one? Don't get so stuck in the work, in the work that puts food on the table that you don't forget, that you forget to do the work you want to do. That's sort of the opposite side of the coin. You know, I think people can get distracted from their first love by, you know, making money. And making money is great. And I'm happy that, you know, I'm happy that, that I do. But the first love for me 
is inspiration. The first love is beauty, the ideas of God. So it, it would be a tragedy to get diverted from doing the most pure thing by something that's 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 less less pure. So I always see doing the practical thing, it's a stepping stone to allow the inspired thing. So my thought is we always have to keep the high goal in mind, even as we're doing the very mundane steps to get there. Yeah, the last the last thing is it's just such a universal idea. Uh, be flexible, willing, and open. You know, God is such God's thoughts are so much bigger than ours are very often. And I find that if I want to be interacting with interesting, fascinating, engaging, empowering, strong ideas, I have to be willing to hear them, willing to find something I never learned before, interact with things that are new to me, uh, be willing to be humble and have a have a learner's mind. I love to to keep learning 25 years into an art career. That's what keeps it alive. That's what keeps me wanting to do it. You know, it's it's as exciting as it was on day one because the ideas are just as new as they were then. And you have to be keep that willingness. Well, if someone is interested or a community is interested, how do they go about reaching out to you and what kind of things that they need to think about as it relates to a potential project, maybe in, in their backyard? Sure. Well, um, I have three different websites to show off my three different types of work. This, this mural here um, would be on my website, stonebalancer.com, which is basically my art website. It has my murals, paintings, um, all, all of the visual art that I, that I do. Um, that's at stonebalancer.com. Um, my, my next one is uh, for the You Are Loved project. It's youareloved.murals.com. And that's specific just to the You Are Loved murals. Uh, so if somebody wanted to put a mural like that in their church or in their neighborhood or wherever, give it as a gift to a local shelter or something, they could go to youareloved.murals.com and contact me there. Um, and the final one is, is my music website, alexcookmusic.com, where you can find all six of those albums, actually many, many more uh, uh, than even those six. Um, lots of, of uh, music that I've written based on my study of the Bible and science and health, um, and hopefully find all kinds of inspiration. And a couple books that you recommend for folks if they're to finding inspiration? Absolutely. Uh, I love these two books, and I will say that they both have, have been great inspirations to me, uh, saving saving inspirations. The War of Art is a, is a really brilliant book that, that, um, that breaks down this, this, this thing of, of resistance. He speaks about resistance. You know, I talked about in a lot of these cases, there was a specific moment of fear that tried to keep the work from happening, um, and he makes a really brilliant point that Resistance never comes when you're doing something that's not going to grow you or the world. Resistance only comes when you try to do something that is going to make the world better. <laughs> and he really just breaks it down in, in very compassionate, bite-sized pieces. So you can, it just helps a person recognize that resistance uh, so that you can, you can re resist it better. And the other, the artist's way is an, very compassionate uh, book that that just acknowledges that it's inwardly really a challenging process to to create things that there's so much to contend with and this and Julia Cameron the author is a creator um, and can, so can just speak with such compassion to the the things that that are difficult for artists. Um, and comes up with all kinds of uh, practices to help a person build up their confidence, think outside their own concerns or fear. And I just found that book very compassionate and ultimately a really a, a, a great support to me. Well, it's been an awesome, awesome, I can't believe it's been an hour already. And of course, we were trying to uh, go less than that, but there's so much wonderful content, Alex, that I just couldn't. I couldn't keep our audience. 
I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cut it off because it's just such wonderful, wonderful ideas and wonderful, wonderful sharing. Um, uh, Sally did ask something. She said um, in the Q and A, I saw something like this on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Is that your particular mural? I don't have anything on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Great. And if anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q and A. Happy to answer those before we. Uh, sign off for the day. And also I've launched our poll. If you wouldn't mind, take a moment to, to give us your feedback. We'd really, really appreciate it. Um, we appreciate that very, very much. Um, so yeah, what an awesome, awesome. I just love learning about all these incredible inspirational stories, Alex, and, and your journey through this career of art and music and really making an impact in your community and, and giving so effortlessly, unselfishly, and thoughtfully. Thank you so much. Um, you, you, men, you mentioned uh, the, the stories and just real briefly, uh, I wanna let the folks know that I'm just finishing a book, basically a, a creative, a spiritual creative memoir that details these stories and you know about 50 more that really flesh out this uh this phenomenon of, of living a spiritual creative life going to god in prayer to to have uh successes so uh it's something that will be coming it'll be coming out this this year uh so if you'd like to learn more about that book you can be in touch with me karen asked if your music is available on youtube it it isn't the way it's, the place to hear my music is is uh, through my website and also you can stream it on you know all the usual places Spotify etc. And and Hemstream, uh, Judith said it's on Hemstream as well. You can, hear, you can hear some of it on Hemstream. Actually, one of my pro my projects of the moment is I'm recording five new hymns for Hemstream that'll be up uh, this spring. Wonderful, wonderful, perfect. So. Um, if you'd like to correct, uh, connect directly with Alex, Alex is a career ally, uh, volunteer with the, with the AVF Career Alliance, and we're happy to help you connect with Alex. Just go to our, our webpage and you can find at avfcareeralliance.org, you'll see on the job seeker student or career ally page, our Twitter feed, and all you have to do is click that little link and it'll come right to his connection and you can find that and make that request. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward and really simple. Um, if you have or know someone who we might be able to help, the Albert Baker Fund is, is really dedicated to serving our community and particularly serving our students um, and helping them with their educational journey Go to, AB, go to the albertbakerfund.org and you can find the different drop down buttons and lots of information and, and, and ways to, to find how we can help you. And again, if you're interested in your career journey and you're a student and you'd like to make new connections and we have some incredible resources for uh, resumes, we have an online career course, just wonderful wonderful things there. Go to the abfcareeralliance.org. And if you know a student or someone who knows a student, be sure and let them know about the Albert Baker Fund's Brotherly Love Fund. Uh, we're helping students right now uh, uh, who are in school for spring 21. Uh, so be sure and let them know that, that we're here to help. Um, the team at the Albert Baker Fund does an awesome job. And be sure and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, and before we close, there is a couple questions. Um, do you have the name of your book yet, Alex? I don't. The name doesn't even exist in my thought yet. I've, I've, <laughs> I've, been, I've been waiting for that inspiration. Great. Super, super. So, well, we've come to the end. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Alex, for this, the inspiring ideas that you shared and your consent, cons, you know, continued support of the Albert Baker Fund and the Career Alliance. And, and thanks to the incredible team, the Albert Baker Fund, for helping me and supporting the net effect. I had a terrific time on this webinar. And if we missed your question, 
be sure and reach out to me at robin at albertbakerfund.org. Happy to answer that and help also connect with Alex. Join us in two weeks for the next episode, February 19th, same time when my special guest will be John Gray, a LinkedIn expert. It'll be a little bit different format because we're really going to get into kind of the nuts and bolts and how you can open doors using LinkedIn. So I'm really excited about that. So until next week, remember to cast your net on the right side. And, and as Alex shared with us, have that sense of patience and calm trust as, it, as your journey begins to unfold. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Loved, loved, our, loved our time together. Thanks for having a terrific weekend. All right. Sounds good. Signing off.